turns off the Smith's music when she's walking by. She's clearly like, I don't know. I'm not even looking. I don't even notice that Tom's there. I've had yeah. a long day. I just want to get home yeah. and like have a glass of wine and watch a movie. That's probably her perspective in that moment. Whereas Tom is like, how is she not looking at me right now? I, these, I'm doing the things that happen in the movies. She's supposed to look at me and say, oh, you're listening to the Smiths? This is my favorite song. Oh, you want to go listen to the Smiths together? Like he yeah. thinks that his <laughs> fantasy is she's going to come into his life. His soulmate, not necessarily Summer, but his soulmate will come to me because I deserve that. Hello, movie friends. Welcome back to the show. We're very excited here to be talking about one of our favorite rom-coms that came out in the 2000s, 500 Days of Summer. I love this movie so much. came out in 2009, directed by Mark Webb, written by Scott Neustadter and Michael H. Weber. IMDb has this at a 7.7. .7. Rotten Tomatoes critic score is an 85% and audience score is an 84%. So critics and audiences are pretty much in agreement for this film, in Amazing. accordance for this film. I really love this movie. I've got a frame poster of it, which I should have brought on the set. I don't know why I didn't yeah, bring it in here. It's right on above your bed. It's, it's above right above bed. your head, literally. It's a personal. It's cute. I walk in your room and you got 500 Days of Summer right it's there. It's a personal favorite movie, like in my top 30. I really love it. And I get something really? new out top of it. Top 30? Every... It's probably, wow. probably around there. I really like this movie a lot. It was very, I was very impressionable with the first time I saw it. Same. You know, Same. 19, 20 years old in college, going through my first relationships and stuff like that. I think it's highly relatable. It's it sub subverts the rom com, whereas usually a rom com is the focus is the female character is the lead. Now it's the male character is the lead. Uh, the the male character is this hopeless romantic just looking for his soulmate, and the female is more of the cynical character. It's not new, but it's kind of uncommon with most rom coms, which I really like about it. It's also mostly f it's mo it's from the male perspective of Tom Hansen's character the entire time, so it is a tricky script in terms of like what it means and the like built-in biases it had it makes you feel while you're watching the film which is actually really clever writing and storytelling and i i get something new out of it every time and i really love it but there's so much to break down especially with tom hansen with summer finn in this love story that isn't a love story yeah and it's not until like the final scene where you really begin to empathize with summer because it's told through tom's perspective and i like that it's made in that way and it's purposely written that way and it's kind of an unfair perspective for the audience because it kind of makes uh, Summer look like the antagonist in a lot of ways. But there are so many reasons why the relationship ended that he obviously was blinded to. We learned that through the course of the film. So it's, she's kind of like the villain in a way. And then it's not till the end where you realize that Tom was just completely blinded by his fantastical way of looking at love. And she was never the right one for him. And there were so many signs and he never he never bothered to look at them because he was so transfixed by her. And then you realize, oh, they're both human beings. So it's not that it's until that final bench scene where you actually begin to fully empathize with Summer because you kind of fall in love with her like he falls in love with her. Then you kind of hate her like how he hates her. And, and you're like mad that she broke up with him. So it's interesting how the script took that perspective and waited a while for you to empathize with Summer. But that's because you're you're going through Tom's perspective of growth as well. And so I think it's important to see his journey and how he comes to the realizations about what relationships are really like. And what I think the filmmakers did a great job of is building these biases that Tom has and having the audience relate to those biases and like building it into our brain while we're watching the film the first few times you watch it making it seem like tom's the hero character he's the protagonist he's the, he's victim. the good guy he's yeah. just the nice guy that yeah. got taken advantage of whereas the more times you watch this movie you get a different interpretation of the characters and you start to realize that there are these biases because the film is purposely told in tom's perspective to show that he is biased about his opinions and that he never really truly probably was in love with summer more of just a superficial of idea of what summer is there's so much to break down but in terms of the filmmaking mark webb did a great job with this film i think this was his first really big feature first film. feature yeah he was big in music videos before this obviously he made the amazing spider-man amazing spider-man 2 but this film has it's very creative filmmaking we have non-linear storytelling from the screenwriters which is really effective at telling this love story animated chapter cards which i really love showing the sequences of uh the seasons of change that correlate with the happiness that Tom is feeling with his time with his 500 days in rain summer. too. Yeah. Uh, we have super eight film reels that are used a lot. We have fourth wall breaks that are really entertaining and fit perfectly. And they, they change the tone effectively outside party narration. We have a voiceover narration from a character we never meet or see. 
Split, grant, split screen sequences are really effective in this film. There's multiple of them, but I also think the expectations versus reality scene is one of the best I've ever seen in a romantic comedy. It's just one of my favorite scenes of all time. Yeah, it's a really creatively made film, especially in the genre. There aren't many romantic films that have a creative twist to them or too much artistic you know, integrity to like the filmmaking. They're basically, most rom-coms, they're generally lit very soft, uh, very simple uh, filmmaking, very simple camera setups. And it's, it's, that's just the way rom-coms are generally made, and that's just the genre. Nice apartments, nice, yeah. nice clothes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Although they, they do have nice apartments Dude, in these this apartments one. in downtown LA are like, wicked it, expensive. Yeah, he lives in a huge, like a, a loft apartment. I might want yeah. to be a greeting card writer yeah, after seeing his no apartment. There's no way he's making that much money. <laughs> maybe in 20, 2009, maybe, but definitely not right now. You're not, you're not making <laughs> like that right. 5000 a month, right. easy. And what's interesting is this is a film about loneliness as well, and it, ha it, it feels like her was a cousin to this movie, both greeting card writers, both having trouble getting over a breakup. So it's interesting that both those films, which are very loved relationship, breakup, loneliness movies, they both have characters that write greeting cards. I think there's an irony to that kind of job. If you're going through such turmoil and so much, you know, things like depression or extreme sadness, but you're writing positive greeting cards, it's an interesting concept to have for a character in that situation to have him work that kind of job. Well, in her, it's not greeting cards, it's letters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Personalized right. yeah, letters. Yeah, still kind of the yeah, same, same thing things, where you're yeah. expressing love for or, other people or moments of emotions for other people. And obviously, Tom breaks it down when he has his epiphany and quits his job at the end of the film, where he's like, he's like, we're selling lies. This isn't real. This isn't truth. We're like giving people an excuse to tell how they feel because they don't want to tell how they feel to yeah. people. They just want, here's a greeting card. Here's that. And versus Theodore writing actual letters that are customized for people, which is the same kind of thing expressing love for other people without feeling it himself yeah 100 percent. and when i was younger when i first saw this movie i definitely interpreted it in a different way i understood the ending and definitely began under empathizing with summer but i still had this like favoritism towards tom i think because he's the lead character i liked jgl <clears throat> those built-in biases yeah the biases right? yeah. so i kind of took his side i think everyone does the first time they watch yeah, it and then the more times you watch it then you see the little things and in moments that he like comes off as kind of just like not the right person for summer and you can see zoe plays it really subtly but you can see moments like when he's when they're at that bar drinking and he points out how like he hates that other woman's outfit and she's like that's you can see the look on her face she's like that's just a mean thing to say like people can dress however they want and also like kind of teasing her about Ringo Starr obviously getting on her nerves it's little things like that where she clearly at moments like these are moments where it's like he's proving himself to not be like the person I want to spend the rest of my life with whereas in, on his perspective he thinks that he's always acting like the perfect boyfriend the thing with Tom is despite all of his flaws the film does such a great job at making you empathize with him and feel sympathy for him and want him to succeed and want him to get summer back and stay with summer it's really interesting because tom really does show a lot of true colors on multiple watches of how toxic he can be but that doesn't take away from the fact that i still love the character i think jgl is so charming and, and likable in this role that's another factor of why everyone loves tom hansen still yeah the wardrobe everything is tasted the music. dance number yeah so like th there's so many things to like about tom and it doesn't take away from the fact that it, it does make me enjoy it less the more i learn about him every time i rewatch this movie because it's not a love story this movie tells you straight up this is not a love story it's about boy meets girl I think it's more of a coming of age story than anything. It's more oh, absolutely. Of a, it's a breakup movie and, and stuff like that because I think the reason why it's so relatable and so many people love this movie and it's very rewatchable even 13 years later, it still holds up today is because people can relate to it either if they've been in the position of Tom where you're a girl or a guy and you've just been pining for somebody, you're, you're going after and pursuing somebody who maybe doesn't want the same thing from you, but you're still kind of persistent, which in this film shows that persistence, like in a lot of previous rom-coms, it's not as attractive as people used to think in Hollywood because Hollywood always portrayed persistence as something that you should try for and you should definitely, do. Definitely not in real life. Clearly, <laughs> like we've seen a lot of movies in past rom-coms or even past movies where if you're persistent, it's very creepy, do not which stand, it really is. Do not stand outside someone's window. And I think this movie, when you watch it, you get the perspective and multiple times you realize that persistence is very creepy and it's not something you should do if someone's up front with you like Summer is, I don't want a relationship. I don't want to be somebody's anything. I don't want a boyfriend should tone it down, you know, tone it down. I think we've all been in that position of trying to pursue someone that doesn't either want us or just wants little to do with us in terms of what we want from them. But I'm, I feel like a lot of people have also been in Summer's position where somebody's pursuing you and you're like, 
all right, yeah, we can hang out. I just want something relaxed, something casual. And I feel like people relate to that as well. And I think a lot of people have been both characters. A lot of people have been Tom. A lot of people have been Summer in different relationships. I feel like I've been both characters in previous relationships. Oh, yeah. That's why I relate to this movie even more. Everyone has. There's always a power dynamic in some way in every relationship. And even if they're not relationships, there's always someone who wants the other person more, I would say. And then in a breakup, there's always someone who wants the breakup to happen as opposed to the opposite side. I'm sure there are plenty of breakups that are mutual, but I feel like even if they are mutual, there's someone that wanted it a little bit more and someone that didn't want it to happen a little bit more. So uh, there's always a power dynamic in relationships with two people. I don't think it's possible to find like complete even 50 to 50 percent maybe that might be not be an impossibility might you might get close but it seems like it's it's kind of hard to get that yeah it it might be impossible to actual find a perfectly even balanced like two people who evenly want each other as much as they can I I guess yeah maybe maybe I'm just cynical you're just gonna be lonely forever <laughs> You're Tom. <laughs> no, 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 I You're was, I was Tom when I was younger. I was, I bought yeah. cardigans because of this movie. I bought cardigans and skinny, <laughs> skinny slacks, skinny ties. <laughs> I was a one thirty five. Yeah, you were bone, bone thin, super skinny. I was like, I thought, and I, I bought the class, t- the clash t shirt he wears. Yeah, had London calling. <laughs> yeah, oh my god, I, I was. Yeah, we're all very impressionable when we're young, and this is an example of because Tom. He's got to be like 24, 25 in this movie. He's been out of college for a few years. Like he says, it didn't work out with architecture. So he's probably like 25 in the, or 26 yeah, in this film. Yeah, probably around the money. And so you, even at that point, you have – like most people haven't been in that many relationships or even found like a truly intimate relationship. So at that point, you still have the fantasy. You grew up with movies. You grew up with pop songs. You grew up with the idea of true love and, and romance. And finding your person and, and all these movies are like, oh, once I find my person, the credits roll and everything's happily ever after. <laughs> and then, and then when you're young, you think that's like the case. And then you realize you have to go through a lot of people. Generally, you have to experience a lot of relationships. Uh, basically, find find the person that meshes with you the best they can. There's no perfect person. Obviously, that's one of the main themes of this film. And you can't be focused on the fantasy of a person because that will blind you like it blinds Tom. But honestly, just finding someone that you know fits into your, your life and into your personality really well. Uh, and, and I like how there's a lot of moments like Chloe Grace Moretz's character, his sister, has a lot of great lines where she's like, just because someone likes the weird, the same weirdo music as you doesn't mean she's your soulmate. The same bizarro crap. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's like just because a, someone likes the same like song you like doesn't make them your faded lover, star-crossed lover. And I, when you're young, it's easy to fall into that. And also, like, I think it, people can be impressionable by the people they are infatuated with because I definitely am guilty of, like, tr- trying to like things that someone I liked liked or getting into things that someone I had a crush on was into to try and seem like a better suitor for them and, and seem more interesting and try, try to force the connection. I'm convinced that half vegans are <laughs> created because of relationships. I'm, I'm convinced of it. <laughs> Nothing wrong with it. I just think... <laughs> Someone definitely puts you under that. <laughs> <laughs> if Trevor Nisar was made today, he should be a vegan. He'd become a vegan to impress her. Yeah. But like that's, I think a lot of people do that. I definitely did that when I was young to like try to like, oh, I like this because you like it, or like uh, I'll. It's you do things to try and attract someone, even if it's not truly you. And because you're more focused on, I need that person, and how do I get that person, rather than tr- being yourself. And finding someone that likes you for who you already are and who you really authentically are. And so when you're young, it's easy to be like, I don't want to be myself. I want to be the version of myself that they would like better. True. That happens a lot in real life. However, I think this film, it's more of a coincidence that they like a lot of Yeah, yeah, I'm not saying it's in this film. Yeah, yeah. so like Tom wouldn't become a vegan for for summer. Like he maybe would already be a vegan if that's the way this movie was. Well, I think he would because there's that moment where she's walking to the office and he plays the Smith song louder. That's because he knows she likes the Smiths and they both like the Smiths. So the thing with Tom is once he finds out that Summer has, like Rachel says, likes all the same bizarro crap as him, he thinks that this is my soulmate. Even though he saw her at at the meeting, he's like, this is, I'm pretty sure, who I'm in love with right now, love at first sight kind of thing. But once they find out they have a lot of the same interests, Tom just becomes infatuated with the superficial qualities of Summer. For example, the same interests, the same music, the Smiths, stuff like that. But also, when Tom does the thing of, when he's breaking the fourth wall, He's looking at the camera. He's like, I, I love Summer. I love this about her. I love that heart-shaped freckle. Mm. I love her smile. I love the way she smacks her lips. All the descriptions Tom gives of Summer are superficial. 
He doesn't talk about her personality. He doesn't talk about her sense of humor. He doesn't talk about her motivations in life, her goals, uh, maybe the way she speaks or, or, or just the kind her of person she yeah, is. Then yeah. her That's heart. A good point. That's a good he point. He only talks about things that are superficial because Tom's obsession with finding the perfect soulmate, his complete misunderstanding of the graduate, which is a great opening of the film, that whole entire sequence, has led him to believe that he'll find his soulmate based on them being a projection of all the things that he it's a, fantasizes a female about. version of him. All the yeah. things that he fantasizes about, he will fetishize until he finds the right person that fits the mold of his fetishes. His fetish, fetishes is what's the fetishes? Quote? Fetishes. Whether it, whether it be the music, the aesthetic, the 1960s look, or whatever, the the dresses, the the, the way she looks, the way she is. Also, Summer has that quality, that yeah. that summer quality that it factor. So Tom is in love with or obsessed with the superficial projection of his fantasies, which Summer fits. That's what he's really in love with. And that's why he's an, uh, uh, what's it called? <laughs> an unreliable narrator. Yeah, very unreliable. Unreliable narrator. This entire film is biased towards his perspective, but it's done on purpose. It's not done as a misunderstanding of the woman perspective. It's done on purpose to subvert the rom-com to show you how flawed this perspective is and when and when you get older and you watch this movie because i haven't seen this in years and i watched it last night i was like because i i always I, as in my 20s and i would watch this movie i'd be like you know tom's kind of a dick sometimes and then when i watched it recently i'm like he's really like in a, in a lot of ways he's not a great boyfriend especially because he's so blinded by his obsession with finding the perfect person and when it, he, well they're not boyfriend girlfriend yeah yeah, yeah exactly i know you, yeah but he's trying he wants to be the boyfriend but there's so many moments and scenes where he's acting so immature. He's being a brat a lot of the time. He's not He's not at all taking her side into account, listening to her perspective. It's all him, 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 him. So he's very self-centered and very selfish in this movie. And he wants to take from Summer when, when Summer doesn't want to give what he wants from, from the beginning. And he's unwilling to accept that. And he goes along with it because he's just happy to be in the same room with her in a lot of ways. To, <laughs> she's, she's like, I just want to be just friends just casual he's like yes let's go with me but you know that's the last thing he wanted to hear but he's happy to go along with whatever, whatever she wants as long as he's with her so he's lying to himself and he's not listening to her at all and it's funny when i first saw this movie i thought when i didn't understand dating i was i was late to the game was pretty late. <laughs> so when she said i want to keep things casual I didn't mean I didn't think that meant like friends with benefits kind of thing. I thought it was like friends. <laughs> <laughs> and so the next scene when they're in the bedroom, I thought you were gonna say you thought it was just wardrobe, oh, no. dress casual, just casual. <laughs> so the next scene when they when they have sex for the first time, I was like, oh wow, maybe she just changed her mind. So I was I didn't understand the casual dating term back then. So when I when she said that, I was like, oh, I guess they're just gonna be friends, and he's still still just gonna have a big crush on her. This movie, the two <laughs> characters between Summer and, and Tom, but that's that's wicked funny. <laughs> <laughs> so confused. Um, it's kind of a great example of it's the nice guy and the Manny Pixic dream girl. So Tom is the nice guy, he's the hopeless romantic. You've seen it a thousand times in rom coms. He even plays a similar character kind of in Ten Things I Hate About You, except more realistic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's not like as crazy, like desperate, but he's still. But he's, a, but he's a, he plays. But a they teenager. like each other equally. Yeah, yeah. Him the, and, the girl, him he, and the girl. Yeah, they're just like you know they the, end up together. The, it's the um, forbidden romance. He has a he has a normal crush. In yeah, that, in that movie, just a normal high school crush versus Tom's obsession with Summer. In this, he believes in true love. He believes in destiny. Obviously, misinterpreting the graduate at young, such a young age did this to him as well as falling in love with London and uh, British pop music. So. Mm -hmm. The ending of the graduate if you guys have ever seen that movie you don't don't realize the end of that movie it's not a happy ending that is a sad last minute and a half of that movie it's a brilliant genius shot that's such it's that's, a, it's one of the scariest endings ever actually it's why yeah. it's a masterpiece in filmmaking that ending shot is brilliant i think a lot of people do misinterpret it it's yeah, not it, a happy yeah. ending for anyone who hasn't seen it what happens at the it's end, an old movie yeah, so it's, it's okay movie, to yeah. spoil yeah so <laughs> 1960s um but dustin hoffman goes to the the wedding of his ex who's in he's in love with and he just bashes on the window. He's screaming ah! at her, ah! and, and, and then she runs away with him. And they and she they're like so happy running across the streets. And then they get on this bus and they get on the bus and sit in the back of the bus. And she's in her wedding gown. And they're both out of breath. And they, and they start laughing. They're like, "Wow!" That was, and they're just like, "That was so crazy!" Like, and they they they're elated. And as an audience member, yeah. you're like, "This is great." But the director holds the camera for another about minute and a half. And then their elation and excitement and and 
it slowly devolves into you know a little bit more serious than they're they're not even talking to each other they're just like embracing the moment and understanding the repercussions of what they just did and then, then their faces drop and they're just like the looks on their faces are like shit what did we just do and that's the end of the movie so it's, it looks like it's a happy ending, but at the end, it's like they made this decision that is going to probably ruin both of their lives. And Tom grew up as a kid thinking that's a happy ending, thinking that they're soulmates, which is why he wants to always find his soulmate. And the problem with Tom is, yes, he's a nice guy, but I think this movie shows you just because you're the nice guy it doesn't mean you're still not toxic. It doesn't mean oh, you're yeah. still not persistent and obsessive and i think tom thinks because he's such a nice guy and i'm different than other guys and i i would be the best boyfriend ever he thinks he deserves summer's attention he thinks he deserves our sexual relationship relationship from summer he thinks he deserves summer in his life forever and that she's the one because i'm a nice guy and he gets like so angry when she's not like picking up on his extremely subtle signals and and what and what's really what really makes the difference because he's so confused at the end why she got married he's like how did that happen he's like i don't understand why and she tells this story about how her her now husband she was reading a book in a in a deli and he just walked up to her and asked her what she was reading and this is an example of she's she's telling the story about this guy that made the move she, it's one of the first instincts that tom never had he never made the first move she made the first move and even when he had the opportunity when when uh, mackenzie told her that he liked her outside the bar and she asked him, do you like me? And he still wouldn't admit it. That, that was, I think, is the first indicator that, you know, she she wanted the guy to make the move first. She was looking for someone to, you know, insert himself into their life. And that's why I think the first in moment of the, the husband going up to her and approaching her, that was striking for her compared to Tom, who she basically had to, like, weasel, like, had to convince him to, like, hey, we can do, we can have fun together we can together. make out, the, we can make out the coffee room so i think there's a lot of subtle things like him being afraid and unwilling to make the first move and, and be true to his, himself and his feelings and admit that he liked her i think that's the first indicator that summer would never want to marry him yeah possibly and also this movie tom's going through the concept with a great non-linear storytelling of being happy pursuing summer being in summer's life and then being in a somewhat happy casual relationship he's the happiest he's ever been in his life. He's like the best person of himself because he's in love with someone or he thinks he is. And then constantly going back and forth between the breakup and post breakup and all that. I think maybe, and then summer, summer telling him that it was fate. You know, you were right the whole time, Tom, even though you don't believe in destiny and true love anymore, you were right. And I kept thinking Tom was right. So she could be believing in that and thinking that fate is real and true love is real. Or this can be Tom's unreliable narrating to the audience thinking this is what happened to summer is fate happened to her it could be either one because tom is an unreliable narrator so you can't always trust everything we're seeing or saying i think when you watch this movie which oh. is why i think it's so fun and interesting and i always get new things from it but i like to see that you know does tom change at the end is he stuck in this loophole when he meets autumn he's going to go through the whole same thing and i think he's grown as a character i don't think he'll go through the same loop because this is the probably the most defining the, moment of his when life. When he quits is the scene of the indicator he's yeah. changed. So I don't think he's going to go through a loophole or a loop of being stuck and constantly being the nice guy and obsessing over women and doing the same thing. Because, like you said, he makes the first move with Autumn. He asks Autumn out, asks her for coffee. Well, she, she talks to him first. True, but he does yeah. ask her out. Yeah. He, and he didn't do that with Summer. Yeah. Because remember, Mackenzie's like, you could just ask her out. And he's like, don't, don't be, be an, an idiot. idiot. <laughs> so maybe that's something that's changed in this perspective now. Is like, if I want to pursue someone, it's I It's going to happen I on should, its own. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it'll happen, but yeah. also I should make the move or if I want that to happen. So I think, I don't think a, a lot of people think he's going to be in an endless loop of his life doing this with women. I think he's changed by the end because oh, yeah. of the experience with Summer. But I also think that ties into the concept that maybe fate is real in this movie and true love is real. Yeah, I think at the end, he's they're going to start a relationship and she might end up being the person for him. And he's ready to he's ready. He understands and he's ready how to approach that because he was always forcing it with Summer and probably the other girls in his life because in the opening scene, his buddies say it's like it's just like his other ex girlfriend that same breakup. It's Miranda Heller all yeah. over again. Or whatever. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that that green card scene where he quits and he understands how obsessing with the idea of fantastical love and promoting that is is like a the sickness in in the culture. 
that's his biggest moment of change where he shows that he's not that same person anymore. And because at first he decides not to ask out Autumn, he's, he does, like, if if an earlier version of Tom had met Autumn, he would have been obsessed with her immediately. But then he, it's like an after moment, like, when he's walking towards the office. You know, He's like, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to ask her out. So it's not like he was already obsessed with her. When he first saw Summer, it was like star, like starstruck, like love at first sight in his eyes. Whereas he probably doesn't believe in love at first sight anymore, but still there's the thing of fate. I think he's he wanted to reject the idea of fate. And then when he when he decided to ask Autumn out, he's like, you know what? Maybe it is. Maybe Summer was right in the, in the bench. Yeah, I think we learned a lot that Summer was correct about in this film. And she also represents the Manic Pixie Dream Girl. Manic Pixie Dream Girl is usually, it's interpreted as a female character written by usually male writers, male directors, and, and filmmakers for like the dream idolized perspective or, or infatuation of what a male character would want in a film like this, for example, like it's in previous films for sure. I mean, the one with Natalie Portman in, in um, what is it, Orange? Oh, with Zach Braff? Yeah. What's it, Golden State? Garden State? Garden State. Similar kind of character there, yeah. like the cliche manic pixie dream girl if you want to call that cliche this is just a perspective in a just like not official term but manic pixie dream girl summer's probably the ultimate manic pixie dream girl and again tom isn't truly seeing summer for a human being or a person he's seeing her just superficially as this dream girl what she represents what she yeah. represents and all this this opinion of of what he thinks about summer really is what blinds him to all the signs that Summer's trying to lead him on, that this isn't a real relationship, I'm not in love with you. It blinds him into thinking he's in love with her as well. Like I keep saying, and we keep saying, she, he's just infatuated with the idea of her. He just keeps seeing what he wants to see. And again, he's not in love with her personality. He's, we never learn about Summer's hobbies. He never talks about what she's really like as a person. Just her superficial qualities. Well, she he learns more about her when like they have that moment where he goes over her place for the first time. There's that's her opening up to and him. She, okay, so yeah. that scene when they're in the bed and he's telling she's telling him the stories. Yeah, what's going on in Tom's head? He's talking to himself in his head. He's not mm. even listening really. Yeah, he's he's, he's just, just like fascinated that he's there. Yeah, he yeah. waits for her to stop talking. Then yeah. he's like, well, I guess I'm just not. No, anybody. And you're, yeah, you're he right. He might not even yeah. be listening to yeah. her. You know, I mean, he, even though the narrator says he's listening, he says Tom thinks to himself. He's just like more like focused on himself. Exactly. Being there. Yeah. So if you think like about he it, even, this goal, even that moment is about Tom. And also he getting to that, getting to Summer's bed, which is like her most intimate place in her world, in her bubble. He did it in like kind of an unethical way, lying to her from the start because she's like, she was up front. I don't want a relationship. And he wants to marry her. And so it's actually kind of messed up that in he he it was unfair to Summer how he got there because she thought he was on board with what she wanted and that's why she let him in. Whereas <clears throat> if he had been honest and been like, no, I want a relationship, she would have been like, then we're, we can only be friends. So he basically was lying to her as a way of getting into her life. And that's like one of the main reasons why it never worked out because he was never honest with her. You're absolutely right. He wasn't honest with her. He was sit, telling her the things that he she wanted she to hear, want to hear so yeah. that he could stay in her life in the intimate circle that she has with him. Now, however, I think two or three things can all be true at the same time. Tom gaslights himself this entire movie. Absolutely. 100% <laughs> gaslights himself. Summer tells him she doesn't want a relationship. She doesn't want to be anybody's anything. Doesn't want to be anybody's boyfriend. However... At times, you could argue that Summer does treat Tom like a boyfriend, which can lead him on because of the kind of nice guy he yeah. is. I think those all can be true at the same time where she doesn't want a boyfriend. He gaslights himself, but she does at moments treat him like a boyfriend because I think if you don't want a boyfriend or you don't want a girlfriend, you don't have these intimate moments with them like in the bed telling them your darkest, deepest secrets and stuff like that and holding hands in Ikea, you can argue that if you wanted it just to completely stay casual, you wouldn't do things like that. However, she is up front. You know, it's completely his fault. She is up front. I don't want a boyfriend. That's not what I want out of this whole thing. But I think all three of those things can be true at the same time. You're right. There are definitely moments where it can be misleading to Tom what her intentions are. And, and it gives him hope that maybe I can eventually, like, convince her and get her to want to be with me. I think that there are definitely moments where Tom misinterprets things and some are maybe got a little too intimate at times but also summer's character is really interesting and we get it we get right off the bat everything we need to know about her her parents divorced and it caused her an emotional distance from everyone and it is a reason why she's never been able to 
hold a relationship, never wanted a relationship. So the the divorce of her parents at a, at a young age highly affected um, how she views dating, and that's why she's always so closed off and probably hasn't had like a really g- legitimate long term relationship in a long time, and why she's always wants it to be casual because she's probably emotionally distancing herself from every man she meets, and it all stems from her childhood. I love the uh, sequence of the background of Summer Finn yeah. with the black and white 16 millimeter film things. It's, it's really cool. You know, Summer Finn is a woman and we go through her attributes and all these fun stories about how she quoted that band in her yearbook and that spiked Michigan sales of that record. And she has that ice cream shop, which, which coincided with like a 300% increase in sales because she's like this summer effect, the quality that like the narrator says every male adolescent experiences at least once in their life is this person this this woman who is just has this effect on all the men around her which again is the manic pixie dream girl in a sense and also fun fact about the ice cream scene when she's making the ice cream cones it's just an entire line of guys that are just there to see summer yeah joseph gordon levitt's in the line really it's not a great <laughs> shot of him it's just his side of his arm and in his he's facing the ice cream stand but he's in line with everybody like that so tom hansen's in that shot yeah that's funny it rep- represents like it's a metaphor for like the fantasy of, of men exactly romantic fantasy i also really like about this movie that there isn't really technology in it it's kind of analog they're not on smartphones even though it's 2009 smartphones were just starting to come out instagram was what 2009 2010 when it came out but i, I like how it's a contemporary movie in los angeles a huge city and there's really no technology involved i prefer movies before smartphones i yeah, like it better and showing up to people's apartment doors and it's just like knocking on the door and like hey i'm here even though you didn't know you're I was just coming. trusting that they're coming yeah, yeah so i think that's really cool I and that's, that's why like his friend shows up in the apartment to like uh, he's actually showing up unannounced with the jo- the job scene yeah even yeah. though they have computers and everything and they probably have cell phones or something yeah. i really like how there are no smartphones involved in this movie at all and technology is just completely ignored yeah and the scene when they're both on their bed after the fight and they're both looking at their portable phones well he has a portable phone and she has the 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 hard line yeah it's, it feels like it's like more of a classic movie because of that yeah absolutely but there's so many great moments in like so many scenes i want to talk about like the elevator scene the karaoke scene but before we get into deep dives on all these moments of the film how about we'll go into our intermission sounds great before we continue the best way to support raiders of the lost podcast is to tell your family and friends about us use our coupon codes and become a patron at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast get awesome perks like weekly bonus episodes for all patrons. You get a personalized message from us, video message. $10, $25, and $100 to your patrons get access to our Discord where we interact with you every day. Have watch parties as well. $25 and $100 to your patrons get their own custom episode. You pick the topic and we cover it for you. $100 to your patrons are executive producers of the main episodes of the show. You hear your name at the end as well as get a custom watch party with, with whatever movie you want. And after three months, you get to come on the show for a guest segment. Patreon allows us to do the show full-time, so thank you so much for the support. Raiders of the Lost Podcast is brought to you by our good friends at Manscaped.com. Use our coupon code Raiders of the Lost at Manscaped.com. you get 20% off and free shipping worldwide. I think Tom might have had a little more success with other women if he had his products from Manscaped. I don't know about you, Anthony. I recommend getting their Lawnmower 4.0 Groomer from Manscaped.com. It's got a 7,000 RPM motor, skin safe, waterproof, has a built-in flashlight, wireless charger. You can use this thing in the shower. It's crazy. Also, their Boxer Briefs 2.0 are incredibly comfortable, very soft, very comfy. They're cozy and they have a little extra space for your junk. So, even more comfort down there for you fellas. Their ultra premium collection is their best deal yet. It comes with all that as well as their two-in-one shampoo conditioner, body wash, weed whacker, air and nose trimmer, and all sorts of other goodies. So head on over to manscaped.com. Join the over 2 million men worldwide trusting them with their grooming needs. Use our code Raiders of the Lost. That's one word. A checkout. You get 20% off and free shipping worldwide. This episode is also sponsored by our amazing friends at MoviePosters.com. Use our special promo code RAIDERS10 to get 10% off your order today. They have a gigantic selection of all sorts of sizes, framing, backlighting, as well as a huge library of pretty much every movie and TV show. James actually got his 
500 Days of Summer poster at MoviePosters.com. I went and grabbed it. I got it here, right here. I don't know. I forgot to bring it out for the episode, but now I you have it. Ran man. and got it. It's actually a really beautiful movie poster. It's got like fi- literally 500 different photos of summer on the movie poster with Tom Hansen down there. Very creative. It's very cool. creative. Yeah, I love that poster. But they are the number one place for all of your poster needs. So be sure to head over to MoviePosters.com and use our special promo code Raiders10 to get 10% off your order today. All right, let's get into our intermission. Let's do it. Let's do it. What quote you got? You ready? No, no, I'm not ready. Okay, I'm ready now. So once you... <clears throat> Let me start over again. Did great job. I messed up. I love that quote. So once we've made the plant, how do we get out? Hope you have something more elegant in mind than shooting me in the head. Once we've made the what? Once we've made the plant, how do we go out? Hope you have something more elegant in mind than shooting me in the head. Huh, so two characters planted something somewhere. They have to escape. <laughs> Actually, a great description. <laughs> just can't think of it. I feel like it's not like an action spy movie. It might be like inverting my expectations. It might be like a comedy or something. Shit. Say it again? Sorry. So, once we've made the plant, how do we go out? Hope you have something more elegant in mind than shooting me in the head. Oh, man, this is... I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Inception. Oh, my God. Arthur says yes. it's a Cobb. <sighs> it's a good one. Yeah, it's a good one. Thanks, man. I thought you'd get that. It was a, It's a tough quote from that movie. Yeah, it's, it's not one of the more known quotes, but now I, I feel dumb for not knowing it. <laughs> All right, here's my quote. You robbed to support a drug habit. I do drugs to support a robbery habit. <laughs> what is that? You robbed to support a drug habit. Oh, man. I do drugs to support a robbery habit. I don't know. That's Jamie Foxx and Baby Driver. Oh, Bats. yeah. Great character. Yeah, you did a good job. All right. Guess I did two pop quizzes. <laughs> That's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Sorry. Let's hear it. So <laughs> for guest movie release here, I literally ask a pop quiz question. Let's hear it. What movie did Zoe Deschanel star in with Martin Freeman, Sam Rockwell, and Most Def? Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. There you go. I believe it's 2005. Yeah, I think it's 2005. Sounds yeah. about right. You can go. You can IMDb a, a movie release year, real quick. While I ask you, what year did Any Given Sunday come out? But don't Google, don't IMDb search that one. <laughs> so Any Given Sunday. Look at so Hitchhiker's Guide. Yeah, 2005. Yeah. Any Given Sunday. Yeah. Pacino. You went Jamie Foxx today. Jamie Foxx. It says 90s. Yeah, I'm gonna go 1997. 99. Ooh. Good guess. What though. a year. Good guess. Oliver Stone made that movie. Yeah. All right, movie pop quiz number two. <laughs> Joseph Gordon-Levitt has two Emmys. What are they for? Uh, Third Rock from the Sun. And what else? For TV. JGL on TV? What the hell? Um, What else was he in the small screen? Um, I'm going to go with... I'm saying they're both. I'm saying he has a guest spot somewhere. <sighs> I'm going 30 Rock. Wrong on both accounts. Shoot. He actually won. So he has this company called Hit Record. It's a uh-huh. production company. They make a lot of cool videos. Remember, I was actually mm-hmm. in one of them. Um, he won two Emmys. The first one is 2014 for Outstanding Creative Achievement in Interactive Media and Social TV Experience with Hit Record on TV, which was a year long of content, I believe. And then also he won in 2020. For outstanding innovation in inter- interactive programming, again with his new show, Create Together. Oh, cool! From Hit Record, give him, give him. So his Hit Record company is really cool. The, it's a giant collaboration platform of artists in production with yeah. artists from around the world. Anyone can contribute to any piece of media on there. It's really cool. And they all earn money. Yeah, you yeah. yeah. I made like two dollars. <laughs> <laughs> he they used a, he didn't like. He's like, oh, this is great. He's all like, man, this guy James is awesome. I was I had a, a short silent film I made. Oh yeah, in college, yeah, yeah, yeah. and they took like a scene from it and put it in one of their little. Yeah, videos. I photographed it. Yeah, in one yeah. of their movies, I photographed it. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. All right, who we? Oh, your pop quiz time. What two Michael Mann movies has Jamie Foxx starred in? Let's see. We got. He's joined by my boy Tom Cruise. I knew you'd get that and one. And what is it oh, called? Oh, you don't know what it's oh called. <laughs> I thought 
thought you would get this no problem. I've, I literally you, love that. I've brought yeah. this movie up twice yeah, in the last movie. week. It's a great movie. Why am I blanking on the name? Oh, man. I can't believe this. It's just one word. It's... God damn it. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. Why can't I think of it? You want me to tell you the character names? Maybe, maybe that'll help? No. What the hell? I literally was like... <clears throat> last week, I, I was going on Amazon. I'm like, I kind of want to watch this movie it's right now. It's a great now. movie. It's a great movie. God damn it. What's it called? Collateral. Collateral. <laughs> All right, the other Oliver Stone movie with Jamie Foxx. No, Michael Mann. Oh, Michael Mann. <laughs> Michael Mann movie with Jamie Foxx. <laughs> Need another cup of coffee. <laughs> Clearly. Jamie Foxx, Oliver Stone. Michael Mann. <laughs> Jamie Foxx, Michael Mann. <laughs> My God. <laughs> My, Oliver Stone is done. He's not involved in this question. Did Michael Mann make Jarhead? That was Sam Mendes. Oh, yeah, never mind. I don't know. Miami Vice. Oh, yeah. The movie. That's right. I forgot he made that. Yeah. I forgot Oliver Stone made that. <laughs> <laughs> Oliver Stone is Jamie Foxx. <laughs> Fun there fact. There is no Michael Mann. <laughs> Fun fact. He's both Jamie Foxx and Michael Mann. He's a talented guy. All right. Do we have any haters this week? We have uh, a couple unsubscribes, yeah. We got... <clears throat> <laughs> x die for something x wrote a uh, tiktok clip wow way to look at the imdb page and call it content unsubscribe <laughs> love you guys heart face he, they got a lot of hate on the comments because they thought he was serious yeah they yeah, thought they were yeah serious. you i saw you defended them you, you you backed them up luke 101 did you guys seriously confuse tuscan raiders with jawas y'all are some fake fans i told you unsubscribe you, i don't know how you convinced me into that they were jawas i didn't convince you yes you did how did i convince it you? it was the tuscan raider scene with obi-wan luke in r2d2 and i was like tuscan raiders right you're like no they're jawas i'm like, sure it's Tuscan. they weren't tuscan raiders you're like no they're jawas i wasn't like I, I think I said you it. held a gun to my head. <laughs> I don't think I was you, that convincing. And you said I definitely was said, like it was Jim, definitely offhand. Jim, they were Jawas, weren't they? I think I said I think they were Jawas. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's how I said it. Well, so I did say Tuscan Raiders first. Yeah. Well, you, you didn't finish with that answer. Don't don't play me. Anyways, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> Do we have Godfather or we're all Godfather? We're all caught up with Godfathers. Come on, everyone, get <laughs> step those numbers up. <laughs> This is rookie numbers. Rookie numbers. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We just released a, a bunch of great Godfather episodes the past two weeks. Yeah, really good ones. The the great one was the Barbie <laughs> BCU, Barbie one, Barbie Cinematic Universe for Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> All right. On this day in film history, today is September twelfth, in nineteen twenty eight. Catherine Hepburn made her stage debut in New York City. In nineteen sixty four, A Fistful of Dollars premiered, starring Clint Eastwood. In nineteen eighty one, Smurfs debuted on TV. In 1986, David Lynch's Blue Velvet premiered. In 2020, Chloe Zhao's Nomadland won the Golden Lion at the Venice Film Festival. And happy birthday to Hans Zimmer. Oh, uh, Hans! Joe Pantoliano, Jennifer Hudson, Emmy Rossum, and Sidney Sweeney. Hans! My streaming recommendation is John Q, starring Denzel Washington on Netflix. I'm going to cry just thinking about that movie. Mm -hmm. He's so good in that movie. I selected Thief. Which Amazon Prime just added to their library. So go watch Thief ASAP. Great movie. Let's get back into 500 Days of Summer. Now, I want to say real quick, this is written in the male perspective, but guys do not call, call girls skanks for not liking them. Yeah, yeah. This is, there's a little <laughs> little too much skank yeah. naming. <laughs> of, like, I, just because a girl doesn't like me doesn't mean I'm going to be like, that skank, that yeah. slut. Yeah. So that's a little... Kids, maybe. Yeah, yeah, kids, kids maybe. Kids would say that, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we don't say that. <laughs> but um, there's so many great qualities to this film. I know we've been tearing Tom apart. But I still like Tom as a character. He's still you still root for him, and yeah, that's that's a testament to the the writing and the screen in the filmmaking. That even though he's the he's the lead character and he's very toxic, you still root for him, which is really it's interesting. It's because he's being affected so badly by it. You just feel bad. You for feel him. his yeah. feelings, which is really great, you know, filmmaking. And but there are so many awesome qualities to this movie. I think first and foremost, the music to this movie is yeah. tremendous. You know, Mark Webb did a great job selecting the pieces of music. I don't know which ones were specifically made for the film. I think some of them were like when he's talking about Summer for in Breaking the Fourth Wall, saying, I love how I hear this song when I think of her. I'm sure something like that was written into the script. But in general, great music choices for this movie. Regina Spector has a great song in this, the expectations versus reality that just breaks my heart. That my heart, my heart. Breaks, <laughs> breaks my heart. My heart can break your heart. <laughs> why, 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 break my heart. Why did that come out Southern? 
breaks my heart. Billy Ray Cyrus over here. <laughs> my achy, breaky heart. That song, dest- <laughs> that scene destroys me, but the song is yeah. one of the main reasons why it's so emotional. It's brilliant, that, that song. So Regina Spector's music on this film is tremendous as well. But, like, the theme of the movie is Sweet Disposition by the Temper Trap. Yeah, it's great. That's, like, the, it's been placed twice in the movie, and it was in the trailer. It was, like, the song of the movie, and it, felt, it was, like, the heartbeat of the film. That was a huge song when it came out. And I actually made, I used to listen to this album all the time. It's a great yeah, album. Yeah. Um, you Make My Dreams Come True. Yeah. You Make My Dreams by Hall & Oates. That they, sequence, this movie got me into Hall & Oates. That sequence is incredible. You know, it's the first time he finally got to sleep with Summer. So obviously guys, after they have sex with the girl, they're really into it for the if first time. it goes time. well. This is, this, I can, <laughs> I can confirm. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I just, you're really pretty. It's just like, I'm nervous. <laughs> <laughs> then you're not dancing yeah. afterward. <laughs> but, if it, but if it does happen, Happen, I can then confirm, you're like shit. I can confirm you have a dancing montage in the city with random people, but it's really great. It's so fun, uh, because Mark Webb, being a great music video director, brought all those elements to this film. The sequence, you know, he looks in the reflection on the car. He sees Han Solo looking back. That's my at favorite him. part of the movie. He just dances. Yeah. We have the cartoon bird. It's really tremendous. It really lifts your spirits. And geniusly, what this film does is after this moment, after the sequence, this great music video dancing montage, he gets in the elevator. He's the best moment of his life right now the doors close the doors open up again and he's depressed and he looks like shit disheveled so this film does a great job going back and forth with immediate cuts of when tom's happy when he's depressed yeah that's that's it's one of the strengths of the film is the bouncing back and forth but the music is it really makes the movie in a lot of ways like hall and oates i never heard of them until this until this uh, movie came out then i became a big hall and oates i'm sure you heard the song yeah i've heard the song i just didn't know i wasn't aware of the band but the, it's really well selected music, uh, and there's there's a whole team that is involved in helping select music for films, and they did a great job. It really it really is one of like the top like five in that in this genre with albums like Garden State. This one are a couple of the best ones we've had in, in the romance genre for sure. Another great jump cut of happiness with sadness is when they go to IKEA for the first time. The mm. first shot of the IKEA, Tom is doing the. Hun, our sinks are broken. Our sinks are all broken. And you can see, like you were talking about earlier, how Summers is probably sick and annoyed by all these references to past moments of their supposed yeah. relationship. And then it cuts to them at Ikea at happier times, you know, running through the store, having fun, playing fake kitchen, playing house. fake house, yeah. and they're having a blast. And then it cuts to, you know, it shows the opposite before that. So I think that's another great moment of showing the perspective that Tom had when he finally eventually does look past on the relationship that things weren't always happy, things weren't always positive. There were moments that he missed and didn't realize or he chose to ignore that could have given gave him a hint that things were going to end. Yeah, and one of the best ones is uh, jumping back and forth between the pancake, pancake scene because the pancake scene we see early on in the breakup and Summer is so cold and indifferent to him. And you don't understand why. And that's one of the reasons why it, it's really well done in, ter- in terms of taking his perspective of making her look like an enemy and a villain. Because you, she seems so indifferent during the breakup. And you think it's a breakup. You think it's like a relationship breakup. But we're not, we don't know that yet. It's not until halfway through the film that we learn that, like, oh, she never wanted a relationship. But in that pancake breakup scene, you're like, man, how could she just break up with her boyfriend like this in such an indifferent, emotionless way? It's not until later on in the film we realized she's like this because she never wanted a relationship and they weren't even in a relationship. And I think that's smart how they bounced around like that to make us uh, feel animosity towards her for the first half of the film, even the first like 75 minutes of the film. So it was, I liked how they jumped around with that. And then when we get to the them in the record store and then he's like, how about we get pancakes? Then you're like, then you understand and her, the way she's acting with him. When he pulls out that Ringo Starr record, like kind of teasing her about Ringo Starr yet again. And you can see she's like, she's tired of this. And then when he, she wants to go home, she wants to just call it a day, but he's like, let's get pancakes. Then you understand like, okay, this is why they're breaking up. You really understand her perspective after a lot of the film pl- takes place. You understand where she's coming from, why she had to be so cold and indifferent because she had to like lay down the law. Like, this is not a thing. We're not a relationship and we can't do this anymore. That's, I think, a really great job they did with the script of bouncing between those two sequences. I also think that the expectations versus reality sequence does the same thing in showing, most importantly, between these two characters, that Tom's entire life revolves around Summer versus Summer, whose life doesn't at all revolve around Tom. So this sequence happens 
well after the breakup and Tom's going through his depression. He's trying to figure his life out. He's trying to get things going, but he's still in a slump. He still hasn't gone back on his feet. And he goes to Millie's wet wedding and he's on the train. They run into each other on the train and they go to the wedding. They have a nice time. It's almost kind of like what he thinks is a rekindling of their love. And he's like, oh, this could be a he's thing like, again. This is it. Yeah. I might get her back. And they sing. They have fun. They dance. She sleeps on his shoulder. She sleeps on yeah. his shoulder on the train by accident. She didn't mean to do that. And then, you know, they dance together at the wedding. And at the wedding, she invites him to a party that she's having. Clearly, it's probably not an engagement party or anything like that. Like that, it just seems it happens to be a party. Yeah. And her boyfriend that he didn't know she had at the time also hadn't asked her to marry her yet. And so he shows up. We have the expectations versus reality sequence where Tom's expectations obviously don't meet his reality, which never happens in real life anyway. So it's really accurate and really relatable to watch a sequence where, you know, you think about how this interaction is going to go, whether it be a date or hanging out with friends or, or whatever it is. And you think you're going to have this this experience when in reality it's a completely different experience or maybe the polar opposite of what you thought would happen. This sequence is really important because it shows that Summer has an entire life outside of Tom. She has friends. She has people that come over to a party. She has a fiance. She has been living her life like nothing happened because she's just moved on. And she, like you said, always was feeling and living that way. She was living her life without Tom being the main focus. Whereas Tom, his expectations are this whole party, it's going to be about me. She's not going to be mingling with her guests. She's going to be talking to me in the corner by ourselves, just us intimately being alone together versus her entertaining guests, which is more realistic, obviously, because that's what happens. She has guests there and he sees the wedding ring. She has lived her life and has a whole life outside of Tom, whereas Tom's entire being in life is summer, but it still is very sad. It's crushing for Tom as a viewer to watch him go through such heartache, such a tough breakup, and then to see the person that you are you think you're in love with get engaged and his whole world is shattered with the Regina Spector song. It's really beautiful and tragic at the same time. And I love when he leaves, goes onto the street, he's walking by himself, silhouetted. Then we have the pencil sketching come out in front of, over on top of him. It's really beautiful. Yeah, a great sequence. And I think that we don't, we obviously don't know anything at all about the fiance and eventual husband. But I think there's another clear difference that I'm sure the the qualities that the fiance husband has is I'm sure that when the husband met her in the deli, he was a fully formed person and had a life, his life together. Whereas Tom never had his life together while he knew Summer. And you, a great little subtle hint of that is when they first interact at the office party and she's asking him about architecture and he and he says he's just been it didn't work out. He's been stuck at this recruiting card job for a while, a while. So you can see she's she's asking him about that and why he didn't pursue it. And he's not really given an answer. And he she she he clearly is someone who's given up and isn't really being true to himself. I think that Summer understands that about Tom immediately, which is why she's not drawn to him in a way that she was probably drawn to her husband when she first met him. So there's a lot of instances where Tom was never ready for a relationship. She, he was never ready for being, he was never his true self or honest with himself or a fully formed version of himself. He was always like uh, kind of just like untapped potential, had given up and probably put all of his focus just in the woman of his life and not in anything else. And I think Summer subconsciously found that immediately unattractive about him, even though, even though she found him attractive, that was an early sign of like, this is someone I, I will, I mean, I'll date him, but I don't want to be in a relationship with this person. I think Tom's obsession with Hollywood, and this is a great metaphor with the greeting card speech he gives at the end of the movie when he finally comes to terms with the things that he's been blind to his whole life is he's been waiting for his soulmate to come to him. He's been waiting because of all these movies it happens, the soulmates meet each other. He's been waiting for that to happen to him. That's why he's not confident enough to speak to Summer immediately and waits weeks before he talks to her at the party and everything the, with the uh, the cider or whatever it is, the sparkling wine. And he does the things like turns up the Smith's music when she's walking by. She's clearly like, I don't, I'm not even looking. I don't even notice that Tom's there. I've had yeah. a long day. I just want to get home yeah. and like have a glass of wine and watch a movie. That's probably her perspective in that moment. Whereas Tom is like, how is she not looking at me right now? I, these, I'm doing the things that happen in the movies. She's supposed to look at me and say, oh, you're listening to the Smiths? This is my favorite song. Oh, you want to go listen to the Smiths together? Like he yeah. thinks that his <laughs> fantasy is she's going to come into his life. His soulmate, not necessarily Summer, but his soulmate 
will come to me because I deserve that. Yeah, because I've been the, told that yeah. in movies. The elevator scene too, where he asks how her weekend was, she goes, "It was good," and he's like completely offended and can't believe it. Yeah, she, the way she said "good," she basically said she banged some guy all weekend from a guy she met at, that at she the met gym. at the gym. Yeah. So it's it's crazy. So I think Tom has been not necessarily brainwashed, but because his misinterpretation misinter- of pop culture, movies, music, he thinks he deserves his soulmate to come to him. Yeah. Which I think is why he's obsessed also with Summer. Yeah. Yeah. Or he And he clearly has done this before. Because when he tells his buddy that he's in love with her, his friend's like, this is not good. It's Amanda Heller all over again. Yeah. So he they he's probably done this many times before. And it's probably a recurring thing in his life over and over again since he was a teenager. And that's why Rachel is such an important character. She's so great in this movie, Chloe. She's Grace a great Moretz. actor. Yeah. She is the voice of reason that Tom refuses to listen to over and over again until the final conversation they have. You know, she tells him, obviously when they're playing we just because some girl likes the same bizarre crap as you does not make you soulmates. He ignores that completely. He says, oh, we're ridiculously compatible. We talk about banana fish for an hour. The last scene he has with Rachel is, at her soccer practice, he's you know, you're sketching. He's just got he's drawing a photo of Summer with a knife. <laughs> she tells him, the voice of reason, the, the the wisest character in the film, that I think you're just looking back and remembering the good things. I think you should look back again, and you'll probably realize that it wasn't as positive and happy and magical as you think it was. And this this moment that Tom starts to do that finally even though he's been eating twinkies and whiskey and orange juice for days now he finally Get a room. he finally really? changes his perspective on what happened in the relationship and how it went and he's remembering things that he was ignoring before whether it be and he's remembering things that he ignored before whether it be summer not taking his hand at the record store um at the movies the situations there why she was sad that day all sorts of things yeah, when that, they saw the graduate. that he pushed yeah. away and now he's realizing that it wasn't always a happy experience. It wasn't always a happy, loving relationship. Even though he's still bitter, this is what finally gets him to get motivated and to start changing his life around and start taking agency in his own life because Tom's, focusing on him. Tom's yeah. a character, and a lot of people do this in the real world where they're focused and dependent on somebody else to make them happy. He's looking for someone, his soulmate, to complete him, to make him a happy whole person, which is a huge mistake to do. Because you'll never be a full person if you do that. And I think that Tom finally maybe realizes that. Not a great plan. Not, not a great plan at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, I've, I've done that in the past for sure. When I was like in my early 20s, absolutely. You kind of like live for the person that you uh, are infatuated with. And not everything else goes to the wayside in a lot of ways, which is not a healthy way to live your life. To put uh, a person above everything else that's happening in your life. Because it's your life. You're living your life. You're not... They're not living your life. You have to handle your stuff before you can like really put yourself in a, a healthy relationship and uh, find find the ability to open up and love someone in a healthy way. Which is uh, he hasn't been loving in a healthy way at all even, ever. Even the girl on the blind date tries to like give him this perspective yeah. when she's like, "So she told you up front she didn't want a boyfriend. Did she ever cheat on you? Did she ever take advantage, take of, advantage you. of you anyway?" And he's like, "I have a great idea. <laughs> Karaoke. It's yeah. silly." It's it's ridiculous. So he's just constantly blinded to all the signs. And also, when when he and Summer have that debate about love in the karaoke bar in the first act of the film, it's like it's so obvious they're not meant to be together. Yeah, it couldn't be more obvious. And yet he's just he's got this look on his face of just like bliss and it's like she's talking to me and like uh, he's just like completely head over heels. And he's he's not he's he's listening to what she's saying, but he's also being he's also like. I'm, I can change her mind. Like I can, yeah. I can convince her in the back of his head, and uh, like not even understanding why she would think that way. It's the it, such a big red flag for him that like this is not a person that you should even be pursuing. This movie though, it's also so heartwarming. Yeah, it can be. Yeah. And incredibly funny. Yeah. You know, so many great original jokes. I think a complete misunderstanding of the ending of the movie. The Graduate's a great one. Um, where he's saying, where Summer says, all we do is fight. We've been Sid and Nancy for months now. He's like, Summer, we've had some disagreements, but I hardly think I'm Sid Vicious. And she's like, no, I'm Sid, and so I'm Nancy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's really funny. Yeah. Um, his friend Paul, he's like grilling him. He's like, the girl, you've been obsessed with the, over for all sorts of weeks. And he's asking her about all the jobs. He's let like, me know if any jobs come up. Yeah, let me know. Did you know that um, they said hum job instead of blow job so they, could not get, so they wouldn't have to get an R rating? A hum job? Yeah. Oh, 
Uh, I guess I didn't notice that. I love the modern modern art joke where they're at the art, modern art museum. They're trying to sound like they appreciate it in, yeah, their, yeah. in, in trying to make nice statements about them. They're like, you want to go to the movies? Yep. Yeah. Let's yeah, go. Yeah. I love that one. Uh, also, the drunk, dep- the drunk depressed scene with the blind date. He's singing and she gets up and leaves. He's you like, don't look anything like summer. Like, Waste of time. You don't look anything like summer. <laughs> <laughs> Waste of time. So funny. Yeah. It, so many other great jokes as yeah, well. Yeah, and, and the camaraderie between him and his buddies is, is good for the for the entire course of the yeah, film, too. Yeah, Paul They're McKenzie all funny. are really great. They're all funny and, together. And Paul, he's got a great perspective on life, too. But, you know, in his fourth wall break, he's talking about, like, I guess the girl of my dreams would be, like, have more of, like, a bodacious rack and stuff like that. But, you know, my what, I can't remember his girlfriend's name. Like, she's she's real. He has the perspective of that Tom doesn't. Yeah. Where he's not looking for what his fetishes are, what his his fantasized version of the perfect dream girl is. He's accepted that he's fallen in love and that he met someone that he truly does love and a partner and, yeah. and maybe fate was real. You know, we met in the seventh grade. We had the same school schedule. So <laughs> it's wicked funny. Yeah. He understands that. Whereas Tom has the perspective of, I need to find my dream girl. And ironically, Tom, ironically, Tom should listen to what he says since his friend's been in a, a marriage for years. Like, what do you know about dating? Yeah, like, he's and he's and he's just so stubborn, he won't even listen to this guy who is living the life that he wants to live. He's with his his the love of his life, and they're obviously in a happy, healthy relationship. And Tom wants nothing to do with his advice. And then poor Mackenzie, he's, he's just yeah, like, poor Mackenzie. as long as they're cute and willing, I'm flexible on the cute. <laughs> he's great. That actor's funny. He's in a few things. Yeah. <laughs> but he always cracks me up in his, in his work. But this movie's great, and... I think it's a, an awesome addition to the genre, especially because it's written from the male perspective. I like how it kind of turned the some of the tropes and expectations on its head. I think the filmmaking is very creative. I I, I imagine that Mark Webb he could have made if he didn't do Spider Man he he might have been made a few more creative like indie films and would have a, a very different career. I would think if he if he didn't. I mean, you're not gonna say no to Spider Man. And that's doing those two movies probably took yeah. about five years of his life. Yeah, so I think but because this movie's so creative and you obviously can't do that in a in a huge studio movie, especially a superhero one, you can't use your creativity too much. And so I think he might have been restricted as an artist over like the last seven years because this is a really terrific debut film. It's really awesome. He did a lot with it. You, I've never seen anything like it in the romance genre before, and there still isn't anything like it in terms of the creative filmmaking, the tone. Um, it's the, contemporary Annie, Annie Hall. Yeah, right? yeah, but yeah, in a lot of ways. But it's just it, it's really unique, and had a, it has a singular vision. It, it's, you can't put a finger on, you can't compare it to any other movie. There's nothing that's been made like it. Yeah. So it's really its own thing. Something else that's really unique and creative is the French expressionist film yeah. montage, where it's the three it's Swedish, sequences. Swedish, is there Swedish? Yeah, it, it was all Ingmar Bergman movies. Okay, so the Seventh yeah. Seal. Yeah. Oh yeah, so yeah, Seven Persona, Seals, Just on the Beach, yeah. Persona, yeah. Suffering, a shitload yeah. of suffering. Yeah. Uh, so like the I don't know what the clown one was with the balloon. But, I can't uh, remember that movie name. That movie's name, but it's all Bergman. But it's great black and white recreations yeah. of Bergman's films. Yeah, so that, that's really cool. Like th- suffering, like that. endless suffering, a shitload of suffering. <laughs> so stuff like that. It's like you don't see that in movies. You don't yeah. see that in rom coms. It's highly creative and it works so well. This movie flows surprisingly well with how many jumps there are time wise. There are nonlinear storytelling is so great when you nail it. But, I mean, compared to a Nolan movie or a Tarantino movie, this definitely probably has more cuts in terms of time than anything I've ever seen. It's the – they're constantly labeling it with the day, which helps the audience. So they're they're able to bounce around so much because you immediately get – it's 355 or it's 42 or 15. So you understand immediately before the scene starts where you are in the timeline. So that's super helpful to see. It was smart of them. It wouldn't – it would it would have been a lot more hard to harder to follow – if they didn't have the numbers there. And also the seasons and the great graphics they did. But it's also, yeah, it's a great point with the numbers and the cards. It also is realistic to how you look back on your memories and you look back on the time you've spent with somebody and you you, you spend your time focusing oftentimes on the good parts, but then the bad parts creep in. So you could say this entire movie perspective is Tom looking back on everything that happened from his perspective, that's why he could be an unreliable narrator because this whole entire movie could be about memories of their relationship. If it was from Summer's perspective, it'd be like this creepy guy who's obsessed with you. Yeah, <laughs> honestly, really like is he, is he really playing the Smith song in the office as I walk out? He's oh like, my she's god, she's like, oh my god, don't look at him, don't look at him, don't look at him. It's it's funny because a lot of authors they they'll rewrite their books from the perspective of different characters. Uh-huh. 
So I would love. I wouldn't want to see like a, a remake of this movie or a sequel, but it'd be interesting to see a remake with the perspective of Summer in this movie, where Tom, like you said, would just be yeah, a, fawning a, a over her weird guy. She'd be like working, and then she'd look across the office. He'd be like <gasps> staring at her, and then look away. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll give him. I'll give him attention for like five minutes. It's more like oh, he's nice and he's very fun, and I like spending he's time with nice him. Guy. That that yeah, he's a nice guy. He's I like spending time with him. That's her perspective basically, and, and it's like she she uh, she's like. He makes me feel happy at times, and he makes me he he gives me enjoyable experiences. So yeah, I'll I'll, I'll give him my time, but I won't, I'm not going to commit to him. But it's like that's her perspective essentially. Is like you know like we're, I'm single. She says it. She's like we're single. Why not have fun while we can? You know we're in the, we're in a city. Like why not just do whatever we want? And that's that's her perspective. Whereas he's like it has to be love. It has, it has to, to be, be you. Yeah, it has to be you. There's no one else. It's it's so they have completely different perspectives. But I, it's interesting if you think about Summer's perspective of, over everything. Yeah, she's not the antagonist. And yeah. it's really interesting because I, the author, I can't remember his name. I got here somewhere. He wrote this book. It's a book? On story. No, not this. Oh, okay. uh, of another book. So this author, I think his name's John Truby. He wrote a book on storytelling in rom-coms, specifically in romantic films. Um, and... He explains how most romantic films and either rom-coms in the past and present, they're written with the two characters, the leads, whether it's the girl or the guy. One of them is perceived as the hero to the audience, or it'd be Tom Hanson in this, obviously. And the other ones who they're pursuing is labeled and, and written as an opponent to them pursuing them. Oh, like an, oh, it an fits opponent. in a yeah. lot of romantic comedies. This kind of this kind of thing, whether it's like something like you see like Kramer versus Kramer, or uh-huh. um, you've got Mail is a is one like that for sure. Well, I wouldn't I wouldn't put Kramer versus Kramer in there. They're already okay, they're right. already married. Uh, I mean, um, Harry versus Harry's when uh, Mary had when Sally. Harry, when Harry met Sally for yeah. sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've got Mail. Is that the one where she's the the works at the bookstore? right? Bookstore one. So yeah. that one hundred percent with Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan, absolutely. And then some Matthew McConaughey ones, but a lot of them fit the mold where one's the hero and one's the opponent, even though they're pursuing the opponent in the film. Makes sense. So yeah. Tom Hansen's perceived as the hero, and, and Summer is the, the opponent. opponent. She's the antagonizing force. Who he's obsessed with in pursuing. Well, yeah, if you think about it in terms of the story structure, you have – so you have the protagonist and the antagonist, and the antagonist is trying, to, is trying to prevent the protagonist from achieving their goal. So Summer is so – his goal, Tom's goal is to marry Summer – well, his goal in this movie is to get her yeah. back. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. But from start, from start of the film. Okay. Yeah. Uh, from the moment he sees her, his goal is to marry her, and her goal is to keep him at a distance. Yeah. So her, sure, she is putting up obstacles to prevent him from achieving his goal. So that's actually a good antagonist and in the movie. On first time viewing, second time viewing, she seems like an antagonist, but she's a, they're both misinterpreted characters on first viewings by most people, I think. Multiple viewings, you realize that it's actually the roles are reversed. Yeah, I, I'm 100% on Summer's side the whole time now when I watch this movie. But we've all been in both shoes, yeah. I think. We've all had, we all understand both perspectives. We've all been in a lot of shoes. And again, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> both, not just both. Of them, I got all. both my shoes on today. <laughs> I did it. I have a belly button. <laughs> I wipe my own ass. I wipe my own ass. <laughs> Scuba Steve, goddamn you. <laughs> oh, man. But I still love this movie. And I hope we didn't like tear Tom apart for anyone. Oh, I think everyone understands. That, I think yeah. most people, if you've seen this movie multiple times, you realize the nature of Tom's character. It's the movie's about the growth of, of the character from being still immature emotionally. Into understanding and growing by the end of the film. But you see the best parts of Tom when he's happy, which is when he's, I think, pursuing architecture or talking about architecture. The sequence where he's taking Summer up yeah, to yeah. see all this, this yeah, the, the buildings Bradbury in Los building, Angeles, yeah. and the park. He's so happy because he's actually talking about his passion. He's not obsessing over Summer. He's showing what he truly loves, which is architecture. And I think that's why it's a happy ending where Tom is not going to get stuck in a loop. I think he's going to keep pursuing architecture. It- in you can see Summer's look on her face when she's lo- watching him talk about his passion. That's what he never had because, like I said earlier, when they first have that chat in the office, he's like, "Oh, it didn't work out." And then he's like, "She's like, how 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 good is is your work?" And then he showed her the greeting card instead of like that great portrait, uh, that that great drawing on his desk. If he had shown her that, that maybe like these little things of him, if he had been a like a fully formed version of himself, like if he had been passionate. And stuck to his passion about architecture, things might have gone differently because they they purposely show you Tom shows her the greeting card, and then they cut to 
the painting, the drawing on his desk, the architecture drawing. And if he had done things like shown her that, been more positive about his passion rather than less defeated, those are signs where I think Summer would have embraced him more as a person if he had shown his true passions and true true self. When, like I said, I'm sure her fiance, her husband, when he met her, he had the passion of something. He had his own life. And he didn't need her. He didn't need her to be happy. So, I think, yeah, he got stuck at his yeah. job. He needed a job, and he lost his passion for what truly makes him live. Yeah. And so, now yeah. he's replacing that hole, that, that emptiness, yeah, with, with woman. what he thinks is yeah. his soulmate. Yeah, and so if Tom had been... If at the end of the film, if that Tom had met Summer, I think they would have wound up together. That's it. I think it's a happy ending, and I think Autumn could be his, his soulmate. I think yeah. potentially the way I interpret it is Autumn is his soulmate because Summer found a soulmate despite not believing in true love and not believing in fate. She yeah. found that, yeah. being uh, cynical about it. And Tom becomes cynical and then finds it himself, possibly. Yeah, I think it's. I think Autumn and him will be together for, I think it's a forever, thing. forever and ever. Yeah. I think it's a really beautiful movie. I love it so much. There, there's so much more to talk about. I think we covered a lot of it, though. I think we got it all in there, man. There's so many other great moments, like the uh, the happy moments, the the bathroom psych up when he's about to have sex with her is really funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's good. This shower, is what casual people, casual. shower sex. It, it's really great, but. And also, oh, like, th this really captured Zoe's personality, and I think she started doing New Girl, like, maybe five years after this. Mm -hmm. And, like, maybe actually earlier. New Girl might have started in, like, 2015, 2014, but, like, it was it showcased her charm and her unique personality as an actor. And, like, her as Jess is just, like, it feels like it's the same character in a yeah. lot of ways. Because you could say she's in big movies before, it's like, she's an elf, yeah, but yeah. she's not... As, she's not likable that entire movie, not yeah. until like the third act, really, because she's still very cynical. Yeah, and she looks totally different with the blonde, blonde hair. Whenever no, I watch, no bangs. Like Zoe Desch, no bangs. Well. So I think that this, yeah, you're right. This this movie really brought this character and her personality to the big screen. You can tell she did a lot of improvising in this, and it, it, because the Jess character in New Girl is, it reminds me so much of Summer mm -hmm. because Jess is all improvised by Zoe. It's her personality really injected into the into the TV show, and I think that Mark Webb was like, "Yeah, do your own thing." There's a lot of like little things that Zoe does that only like she probably came up with that definitely weren't on the page. And the color scheme of the movie, a lot of the production design in terms of the blue clothing, the blue colors that are constantly around Summer, that was done because they she has such blue, blue eyes. eyes. They wanted to bring yeah. them out even more with the character, and mm -hmm. that's why there's a blue color scheme in in all over Summer. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. That's why, yeah, the blue eyes, they, they pop with the blue outfits. Yeah, I really love this movie, and the writers, one of them, this actually is based on a real breakup he has. So the opening of the film with the Jenny Beckman, is that what it is? Yeah, Jenny Beckman. Jenny Beckman, um, who's mentioned at the beginning, real girl who dumped the screenwriter Scott Neustadter. Summer's based on this girl, and it apparently he said about 75% of what happens in the, mo in the movie happened in real life to him. Wow. However, I'm sure his perspective of the entire situation's changed, and this was a way to cathartically deal with it. Yeah. And it felt like he already had dealt with it by because when you watch the last 10 minutes of the movie, you're like, okay. Yeah, I think he understood yeah. what happened. Yeah, exactly. For sure. And I think this won the Independent Spirit Award for Best Screenplay. I think so, too. Yeah, I think I remember them winning. It didn't win anything. It didn't get nominations or anything for no. Oscars or anything. No I think it should have gotten Best Screenplay no Oscar. Gloves. It's a really tremendous script. I mean... Maybe, yeah. I don't know about best screenplay. Nomination. Oscar, I mean, dude, the, the nonlinear storytelling structure, that's complicated and really complex. Super, super complex. You're it's right. It is to complicated. Do. Yeah. Plus all the little things that they wrote. I think it's a really clever script. It is a very clever script. You're right. It's it's a lot more clever than people think because of the um, the biases that they make the audience feel on purpose yeah. to get you on Tom's side. That's what's really clever about it. And what also I, I think is really strong about this film is like the leading man is not like just like a cliche, like cardboard cutout of every other leading man. He has a personality, and it's like you hadn't really seen that in in the genre of like there's this guy he likes indie music and he's very creative and very vulnerable. Yeah, very very vulnerable, and just his his style, his fashion, his interests. And you hadn't seen that in the genre for men to connect. Like the, the leading men in rom coms are generally like studs. Yeah, yeah, he's the the nice guy yeah. in rom coms. It's usually the crazy yeah, the side friend. character. Yeah. yeah, like the guy. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. That's Tom. Yeah, that's Tom. They gave him a movie. Yeah, she, <laughs> he it's the it's the friend who got a chance with the girl. He's upset. They have yeah. lockers next to each other. <laughs> but he got a chance that he got yeah. to hook up with her. The, yeah, so. they gave him a movie. <laughs> <laughs> that's what this is. You're right, because it's, it's usually like McConaughey or like another stud. Yeah, and, like the great tan, yeah, and the yeah, jawline. Yeah, yeah, the hair, and just like the honk. The honk. JGL's an, an attractive guy for yeah, sure. Yeah, but he's he's like a buck twenty five in this movie. <laughs> 
he's, he's sizing he's, him up. He's not in every like in like how to lose a te- guy in ten days. There's just McConaughey takes his shirt off in the office randomly because <laughs> you're gonna, you gonna show off McConaughey, and the, you're not gonna do that in this movie. <laughs> Good point. So in the JGL takes his shirt off, but it's a silhouette <laughs> with, with the window. So it's like I liked how it's like it's a character, it's a male character that I related to a lot more than the typical rom-com stud who always were like a 10 and like, I don't look like that. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not that guy. Yeah, you don't look like that. But then with, with Joseph Gordon-Levitt, I'm like, oh, I, I can really relate to Tom. Kind of look like Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Yeah, we, we get that a lot with yeah. the squinty eyes. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, it's kind of uncanny. Yeah, we, we, we get that a lot. <laughs> um, so I, I really related to Tom because his interests and style and persona were so much more relatable and a, like seemed like something that, Things where I, I was into and not like the typical like jock jockey kind of guy that was always in these movies. Yeah, they gave him a shot, man. Yeah. They gave him a shot. All right. <laughs> <laughs> that wraps our episode on five hundred days of summer. We really love this also, movie. Or also AKA when the nice guy gets the shot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm a nice guy. I deserve you, right? Uh hope you enjoy this interpretation and breakdown of this great, great independent romantic comedy. Mark Webb is a great director. Hopefully he gets uh, some more shots at some interesting, unique films. So additional, just Gordon Levitt, great leads. Thanks for tuning in around the world. Become a patron today at patreon.com slash Raiders Lost Podcast. Be sure to tell your movie friends and family members about the show. If you haven't already, get them into the Raiders of the Lost Podcast community. Take care, everybody. Bye, y'all. This episode of Raiders of the Lost Podcast was executive produced by our chosen one patrons. Luke Exelston, Tyler McFly, Darren Singleton, Anthony DeMeo, John A. Graz, Becca Keen, Cody Moen, Calvin Cam, and Lauren Smertz. Thank you for watching Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Be sure to hit that subscribe button, hit the like button as well, notifications for sure. Listen to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, everywhere you can listen to podcasts. And be sure to check out this other content we have on our YouTube channel.